My name is Taylor Savage, uh, and I'm a product manager on Chrome's developer experience team, uh, which encompasses the many different open source web developer products that we build uh, here on Chrome. So I'll be talking today primarily about one product in particular, uh, which is the Polymer project, uh, and about how the developer experience team has been thinking about leveraging all the different features you're hearing about on the modern web platform in order to build fully end-to-end -end applications. But like a typical product manager, I, I kind of want to start today uh, by taking a, a step back, taking a 10,000-foot view uh, about why we build developer-facing tools and products and libraries in the first place on Chrome and the role that we see uh, our products playing in the broader uh, web development ecosystem. So our biggest product that we build on the Chrome team is, as you might guess, Chrome the browser. Uh, and our focus when building, on, when building Chrome the browser is to provide the absolute best user experience possible. And so we've built many, many features within Chrome to make this happen, things like Chrome Sync and Autofill, tons of security work, countless optimizations uh, to make page loading faster and more efficient that you've heard about in the last two days, uh, things that, you're, that we're talking about at, at Chrome Dev Summit. But at the end of the day, a browser is really only as useful as what exists on the web to browse. So we don't really make Chrome great. You really make Chrome great uh, as web developers with all the things that you build. So Chrome is just a window onto the, to, onto the applications and websites uh, that you create. So the quality of the user experience on Chrome, the browser product, is very fundamentally tied to the quality of the sites that get put on the web. So on the Chrome team, in addition to building Chrome, the browser, we're looking for opportunities uh, to also build products that help you, web developers, create and distribute really high-quality sites. And the trick, though, uh, for our team is to figure out where our effort is best applied uh, for maximal leverage. Because as everybody here is very well aware, the open source web developer ecosystem on its own is an amazing, massive place. They, you don't really need us. New products for web developers are coming out every single day, are being built and being open sourced. There's certainly no lack of innovation. And of innovation, there's certainly no lack of diversity in terms of the tools that are available for us to use. Today's open source web development world, though, uh, is subject to a dominating force, which I affectionately like to call the JavaScript industrial complex. Um, and this is the positive feedback loop between all the different types of players in, in our ecosystem, the open source projects themselves, tooling that's adjacent to these projects, content creators who write blog posts, who tweet on social networks, conferences, uh, trainings that people pay for to learn more about these tools. All these different aspects are all really critical uh, to generate all the projects and documentation and education and support that we rely on every day to do our job. But the dynamics of this JavaScript industrial complex uh, will sometimes reward shorter-term optimal solutions at the expense of what might be optimal in the slightly longer term. Now, we all want to build tools, that, and we all want to use tools that solve problems that we're hitting right this instant on the web platform. And so it's these sorts of tools that solve our problems today that tend to benefit the most from the system, as you'd expect. Now, fortunately, the web has been designed to be an incredibly flexible platform. And so many of the problems in web development that we hit can totally be papered over in the short term with tools. But unfortunately, with the continual application of these tools, we risk, one, adding a ton of extra complexity to our workflows, and two, ultimately ossifying ourselves at sort of a local maximum. And we all know that getting stuck sort of micro-optimizing at a local maximum is a sure path to obsolescence. So on the developer experience team on Chrome, we try to focus specifically on solving the problems uh, that we have a unique opportunity to solve. So one big, unique angle that we have is our proximity to Chrome the product. So we have particular expertise when it comes to how the browser works, for example. Uh, we have an ability to try to influence the overall web platform. And so we look for gaps in the ecosystem where our particular context and skill set will be particularly valuable. So we work on products like Chrome DevTools, which we can bundle directly with Chrome itself, which can communicate with Chrome at a very low level uh, to help you inspect and debug your website. We build things like Lighthouse, which can seamlessly and deeply integrate with the DevTools protocol to express our particular vision of what makes a good, fast, high-quality site and help you measure your own site against that bar. But another unique position that we have on the Chrome team uh, that helps inform what developer products we want to focus our time on uh, is our inherently long-term view. So the web has a very long time horizon. Uh, and we here on the Chrome team are fundamentally tied to that long time horizon. We're in a very fortunate position in that sense, in that we're very deeply committed to the very long-term health of the web. So we on Chrome, Chrome is going to be here a long time, and we can't really afford to get caught up in short-term hot trends because we're playing a very, very, very long game. And often what this means is that the best investment that we can make 
uh, on the developer experience team on Chrome is an investment in improving the underlying web platform itself. So now here's the rub with that strategy, which is the web platform moves extremely deliberately. Uh, it takes uh, years for a new feature in the web platform to get designed, agreed to, shipped cross-browser. And there's, huge, there's a huge cost also to taking features out of the web platform, if it's even possible to do. So we have to be extremely careful and thoughtful and deliberate when considering what new features we can add to this platform. The road to changing the web platform is a very long one. Um, you've got to get a spec written and then get it generally agreed to across the different browser vendors. And then you've got to implement it in a browser. And then you've got to ship it in that browser. And then you've got to inevitably fix the bugs that come up after you shipped it because you've broken it and it's not useful yet. And then you've got to wait until it's in enough browsers shipped and available for developers to use that the developer ecosystem will actually start taking advantage of it. So for a fundamentally new feature, a fundamental change to the web platform itself to get baked in, it requires a dedicated group of people fighting for that feature in it for the very, very long haul, for years, maybe even a decade. And so we dedicate a part of our Chrome Web Platform team to fight specifically this fight, to analyze the ecosystem and then work with other browser vendors to come up with new features that plugs holes in the platform and then fight in the trenches for the years to actually see these, these, these new features come to life. So this is where Web Components and the Polymer Project come in. So we noticed a few years back uh, that web development was getting more and more complex, uh, that the ecosystem was getting increasingly siloed and locked into frameworks, many of which at their core were solving fundamentally the same problem, which was providing a sane component model on top of the web platform. And again, the lack of a sane web native component model is exactly the kind of problem that can totally be solved in the short term with tools. But in the long term, we'll only really be able to drive towards simplicity with a fundamental change to the platform. And so we set out to create web components. Now, a long story short, uh, a long story short, uh, after many years, uh, web development standards, the web component standards have finally crossed a major finish line. Uh, web components have been natively supported in Safari and Chrome for a while now, uh, meaning that there are over a billion mobile devices out there right now in users' pockets that have native support for web components. So web components are a reality of today's web platform. And we're starting to see the ecosystem uh, adapt to these new powerful web platform features. We're starting to get to that kind of last phase of the component uh, flowchart. New, new development frameworks uh, like Ionic Stencil JS have really exploded onto the scene based entirely around web components. Uh, other frameworks like Glimmer and Svelte allow you to output components as web components. And existing frameworks like Angular and Vue and Preact now provide first-class support for web components. So you can check out uh, Custom Elements Everywhere to see the latest progress on uh, first-class framework support for web components. And web components usage in the wild is actually really taking off, kind of under the radar, but it's really taking off. So we just had a fun realization on the team the other day after seeing another team at another uh, massive company tweet about one of their web components-based launches, which is if you go and if you look up the top 16 global brands in the world, so the 16 most recognizable companies in the world. Nine of those companies, over half of those companies, have a product that is using Web Components in production, and many of which are using Polymer. So Web Components might not be like instant hacker news to the top gold yet, uh, but the adoption is very, very real. In fact, if I were starting a company uh, that was trying to make money on web development, I would absolutely pick Web Components as my technology. So on the Polymer project, uh, we're continually trying to evolve the Polymer library as these web component standards evolve and reach different phases of maturity to make it as easy as possible for the standards to cross the finish line and also for developers to take advantage of web components in production. Earlier this year, we held our third annual Polymer Summit in Copenhagen, where we heard from 25 different speakers about the state of Polymer and also innovations more generally in the web component ecosystem. So we heard from major companies like USA Today and Electronic Arts who are using Polymer to be able to quickly spin up new pages and websites uh, with a consistent design language and with minimal extra engineering effort. And we also gave a sneak preview uh, of the forthcoming next major version of the Polymer library, which is Polymer 3.0. So Polymer has always been about making it easier to build web components, and specifically making it easier to build web components being as close to the platform as possible. And so Polymer 3.0 is a, small, a very small evolution of the library to come even closer to realizing this ultimate goal. There are two major changes to Polymer uh, with Polymer 3.0. The first is we'll be moving from Bower to NPM in order to distribute Polymer uh, and elements built using the Polymer library. Um, 
And the second is we'll be switching from HTML imports to ES modules in order to load Polymer and Polymer-based elements. So the reasoning behind these two changes is fairly straightforward, uh, as everyone seems to intuitively get. Uh, although major other, other browser vendors have agreed to and shipped custom elements of Shadow, and we're already seeing those worded in the wild, we haven't been able to reach consensus around HTML imports. And today's close-to-the-platform way to load code is via ES modules. So on the Polymer project, we're going to follow our own model. We're going to use our own motto. We're going to use the platform and move to using ES modules in order to load Polymer. And there are some really, really big, exciting advantages with this switch. For one, Polymer will become much more compatible uh, with the workflow and tools and other libraries that JavaScript developers are already familiar with. And Polymer elements and applications will also be able to run without any polyfills at all on Chrome, Opera, and Safari. And when Edge and Firefox ship custom elements in Shadow DOM, Polymer will run completely polyfill-free on those browsers as well. And on the Polymer project, we also really, really care about making it these transitions between versions of the library as easy as possible. As you've seen, we've had, we have some really, really big users inside Google and outside Google uh, who have thousands of elements uh, that can't do a major one-off transition. And so we're working on building an auto-upgrader tool that will mechanically and automatically upgrade your 2.0 elements, and even back to 1.0 hybrid mode, if you're familiar with that, uh, to Polymer 3.0. So it'll be an automatic transition. It even upgrades your tests for you. So you can learn much more about Polymer 3.0 uh, by checking out polymerproject.org and the blog uh, for updates. We're still working on a bunch of tooling and support for 3.0, uh, and we expect to have a stable release sometime early next year. So keep an eye out for that. So 3.0 Polymer uh, is really the culmination of what we've been trying to do on the Polymer project, make it possible to build platform native components as close to the web platform itself. And we really think that the web component technologies are a transformative change to the way that the web platform works. But components are really only half the ballgame. Uh, it should also be trivially easy to take these components and assemble full-fledged end-to-end applications. And when it comes to today's ergonomics of assembling web components into apps, we tend to agree with Sam here. Uh, we think there's a lot left to do in terms of improving the developer experience of building end-to-end -end applications taking advantage of web components. And we also think there are some really interesting opportunities to take some other cutting-edge changes to the web platform, along with web components, marry them together, and be able to build really blazing fast end-to-end -end apps that you can deliver to users on mobile seamlessly and quickly. So I don't have a product, per se, to announce today, but I do want to take the second half of this talk to kind of throw out some of the key ideas that we've been kicking around on the developer experience team for the shape of what an app building solution might look like. So Kevin Schaff, an engineer on the Polymer team, went into detail uh, of many of these ideas at his talk at the recent Polymer Summit. So I encourage you to check that out if you're looking to dive in a little more. So really, there are four main problems that we are thinking about when it comes to going from web components to entire applications. The first is how to structure your application for maximal performance how to factor your UI appropriately, how to manage state within your app, and then how to actually serve your application in production. So we'll dive into each of these uh, and see how we're thinking about kind of marrying a bunch of the web platform features into doing these, the, each of these steps of building an application really effectively. So first, structuring preferred performance. The number one way to make sure that your application misses its performance targets is to start thinking about performance after you've already finished building your app. And I think we've hammered this concept home uh, quite a bit at this Chrome Dev Summit. So there's one overarching principle when it comes to structuring your web app for performance, which we find consistently invaluable, which is to minimize overhead. Every single byte of your web app, as you've heard again and again, has to go through this epic journey before it finally gets rendered on a user's mobile device. Every byte runs into so many opportunities for bottlenecks, flaky networks, slow devices. The only guaranteed way to achieve good performance on mobile is to do less. And unfortunately, what we see again and again is an attempt to improve performance by doing more. So a lot of the front-end world today is enamored by the concept of server-side rendering as a means specifically to good performance, where we send down server-rendered static HTML to get the UI on screen while the user is waiting for the rest of the app bundle to download. But unless your application is mostly just static, kind of passive content, what the user actually wants to do is interact with your app. They want to select a departure date or sign up for a newsletter or bookmark a house. And server-side rendering doesn't really help with any of this interactivity. It just gives them something to look at while the rest of their code loads so they can actually do what they came to your app or your website to do. So if you still have to send this large bundle of JavaScript down to transform that initial rendering into something that's interactive, the user is still going to be frustrated. 
And if you don't believe me, uh, here are a couple of real-life examples of how popular server-side rendered applications perform on relatively slow 3G networks. And as you can see, server-side rendered the initial view really, really quickly. Uh, but the problem is on a slow network, it can take a really long time for the JavaScript to load. And that leaves the user looking at a screen that looks like they can interact with it, uh, but this can be an incredibly frustrating experience. So I, I want to I make the point that this is not to say that server-side rendering is wrong. Absolutely not. It can certainly improve the user experience by getting pixels on screen quickly. Definitely a good thing to do. Rather, it just says that there are no shortcuts to delivering a good user experience. We need to focus on the right metrics from the beginning. And so we think uh, on the developer experience team here that for a lot of apps, the right metric should not be first paint, but rather time to interactive. And the best way to ensure a good time to interactive is this. Don't make the user wait on anything that they haven't asked for. So what this means is only send exactly the code that a particular route requires in as few round trips as possible, sending as little duplicate information as possible. And this sounds easy enough. It sounds fairly intuitive. But in practice, this has historically been very difficult given the bias of existing front-end tooling. So this is why we've developed and have spent so much time evangelizing the purple pattern which gives a straightforward pattern for factoring an application for optimal delivery. So with purple, start by factoring code around decoupled routes that fit together into an interactive experience. Use server logic to push down only the components or the data that a given route needs and eliminate round trips. We render and make that initial route interactive as quickly as possible. We use Service Worker to pre-cache the next parts of the app in the background. And then we lazily import this pre-cached code that's needed for subsequent routes from the service worker cache. So we summarize this pattern as purple, push, render, pre-cache, lazy import. So purple gives us a really nice pattern to ensure we're giving the user exactly what they need for a particular route and no more. But to ensure we're delivering the ultimate best user experience we can, we want to measure iteratively as we develop. And so we recommend using web page tests for this. Web page tests recently introduced a new easy mode that you can go to that's pre-configured for testing on mobile devices and on 3G networks. So make sure that you've enabled Lighthouse on webpagetest.org slash easy, and then just enter the URL that you want to test and click Start Test. And once testing is finished, uh, you can click this Lighthouse Score button here. And then under Performance, you can see this time to interactive number. And this is the number that we want to optimize. So there's a lot of different advice uh, out there for what to target for time to interactive. And what we like to say on the Chrome team, and I think you've heard in a few talks at this conference, we talk about aiming for five seconds for time to interactive. We think this is generally a really strong target for a good, solid user experience. We think, though, that the absolute highest quality sites can do even better, down to 3.5 seconds to interactive. And this is the target that we shoot for on the products that we're building on the developer experience team, specifically so we can leave as much headroom as possible for you, the developer, to build sort of more complex apps and still get a really, really fast uh, time to interactive. So on these settings, uh, first byte from a good edge caching server after SSL negotiation will be around two seconds. So this leaves us with about a second and a half to get the routes uh, payload, downloaded, rendered, and ready for the user to interact with. And we found that this translates to roughly 50 kilobytes of code and data that you can send for the initial critical section of your route. So now Polymer 2.0 starts at around 12k gzipped, leaving you with roughly 40k of budget uh, for the critical components that you need for each route. And we found that the best way to kind of get these recommendations across, and the best way for us to internalize them as a team, is to give them a name. And so we're calling this one Purple 50. So for building fast apps on the modern web, you get a really big head start when relying on web components for your component model, because you don't have to download any extra code to provide that component model. It's already baked in there with the browser. But we also think that any modern app building framework should do everything possible to help developers stay underneath this purple 50 rule for any particular route in their application. So that's how we are thinking about structuring performance for performance uh, by minimizing the amount of code that has to run for any particular view. The next step in building an app will be to factor your, your UI and actually assemble uh, these different views into a full-fledged application. So again, web components really, really help us here. So we'll want to leverage reusable components wherever possible, because the best line of code is the one that you didn't have to write. So just like NPM is the go-to source for JavaScript libraries, webcomponents.org is your go-to source for reusable web components. So for a lot of our app UI, we can stand on the shoulders of giants in the community and stop reinventing the wheel and just use web components that others have already created for us. 
Now, we talk a lot uh, about, when, about when we're talking about web components about sort of leaf node elements in terms of the sorts of UI widgets like buttons and drop downs and sliders that the user directly interacts with and are sort of the lowest, the lowest nodes on your tree. But we also think that web components can be hugely valuable for sort of app level structure and organization as well. Using the standard web component model for app components in your app uh, can have a lot of different benefits. So we can achieve a smaller payload uh, and get to that purple 50 number by using built-in browser features rather than having to kind of download our own extra code on top. We can get strong encapsulation for free, uh, which is hugely useful when scaling up to a large team all working on the same code base. We get great built-in developer tool support uh, for web components via Chrome's DevTools. And most importantly, we get the full flexibility in terms of being able to reuse our structural components. So as long as you're using custom elements and properties and events as your component interface, and as long as you're using Shadow DOM to encapsulate the rendering of the component, how a component does its rendering is totally just an implementation detail. So with a web component, you can extend from whatever web component base class you like without losing interoperability. How the component actually works is an implementation detail. Its dependencies are an implementation detail. So this inverts the traditional model that we're used to when building web applications. We can build, for example, an entire application out of Polymer elements, but that's just one choice. Down the line, you could switch some of your components over to using a much simpler element base class, for example, than what Polymer provides. And those can work side by side in your application with Polymer elements one at a time. We can try out using Skate.js in our application without changing any other part of our app. And someone is bound in the future to make an even better web component base class. And we can introduce improvements to our app incrementally without throwing the whole thing away each time. So think about that. If you wanted to change an app from one framework to another, there's no incremental path to make a change like that. Yet this is entirely possible when we're using a standard component model. So this is one of the very real benefits of web components, even for app-level views. We can dramatically lower switching costs for us without sacrificing our ability to innovate and change incrementally over time. We don't lock ourselves in at all when we're assembling our application. So now that we've built our UI, we need to bring our application to life by loading it with data and dealing with user interactions that will change that data. So application state management is perhaps an area of web app development where the platform sort of has the least to say. And so we get a lot of questions about how we do uh, man managing state on the Polymer project. So two years ago at our first Polymer summit, uh, Kevin gave a talk called Thinking in Polymer that put forth the concept of the mediator pattern for how we think about coordinating state changes between web components. So in short, a mediator in the mediator pattern owns a scope of other components and is responsible for propagating data to those components, listening to events from those components, mutating state, and propagating changes to that state back down to components in its scope, but also up via events to any owner of this particular component. And the mediator pattern is really useful cre for creating reusable standalone elements that can handle their own complex state changes internally, but also communicate those state changes externally to anyone that might be interested. And this sort of standalone state management ensures that reusable web components are easily portable between any application context and work just like any other DOM node that you might be used to. So we often will build full applications by composing this simple pattern together over and over and over and over. And eventually, you have a top-level mediator, which is controlling the whole nested tree of components, and you have an application. However, the community has also shown uh, that there can be lots of benefits to having less granular and even global mediators of state. So particularly as components become more app-specific, uh, and are largely used uh, with, as generic components come together to hold application logic, having one mediator for all application data can make your app much easier to reason about. And it also opens up a whole suite of nice developer workflows uh, that we'll get to in a minute. So uh, there are lots of these global mediator patterns, uh, and, and those mediator patterns like Flux formalize this concept of one central place to put application state that's passed down to components, and one place to dispatch events that cause application data to be mutated and passed back down. So we can really just think about this global mediator of state as a generalized global mediator pattern, like I described before, for your entire application. So now there are lots of choices out there 
uh, to implement this global mediator pattern that worked just fine with custom elements. Uh, too many to go into. But we purposefully made Polymer very low level and very flexible, precisely so that you could have many different options for how you want to manage state in your application. But a lot of times, developers will say, just show me one way to manage state that works. Uh, and if you're that person, we do think that Redux is a really good choice. And a lot of people have had a lot of success with it. So the Redux library uh, is very simple, with very little magic and a relatively small footprint. It follows a very easy to understand mediator pattern. And as complexity of your application grows, uh, there's a large ecosystem of add-ons to Redux that can help your application scale in complexity. So these usually come in the form of ways to abstract and streamline uh, async flows in your, in your application patterns. It is uh, also, fortunately, very, very simple to integrate Redux with web components. So let's go back to our global mediator diagram uh, and make it specific to Redux. So the Redux term for the global mediator that manages state is called the store. Elements then subscribe to state that is passed down into an element's properties via a subscribe callback. And in place of events, the elements dispatch what are called actions to the store. And we write functions called reducers that then return a new state object with changes to the data that have happened based on actions that have occurred. So there's a bit of a trade-off involved going from localized state management to global state management. But one of the key benefits that it is, is that it opens up a really nice set of developer workflows, like the dev tools that ship with Redux. Since actions that change state are centralized, it's trivial to log every action that happens in an application and to see the entirety of application state all at once. So there are lots of ways to connect custom elements to Redux, and it's fairly simple to do. But one approach that we really like is to build your views as generic elements that accept properties and fire changes based on user interactions, just like any other reusable web component that you might create, and then subclass that generic element to create a more application-specific version of the element that is connected to the store. By subscribing to the store and setting properties into elements, and then listening for DOM events and dispatching Redux actions as a result. So a key pro tip also to point out, if you're looking to, into a, a global state management technique, most of them don't come out of the box with a way to separate all your different state management code. They lead you towards one big blob uh, of global state management logic. And this is in opposition to our sort of purple concept, only loading the code that you need for a particular route. Now, this is totally possible to achieve with Redux, but it definitely is something that we want to pay attention to in our implementation. So I'll, I'll give a quick example uh, for code for how we'd make a Redux connected custom element. So for, let's say we're, we're, browsing, uh, we're building a browsing style sort of explore view in our application. And we've built our explore page component, which takes properties and events. And then we're going to make a subclass of this explore page that will be specific to our, appli our application and hook into our global Redux store. So in the constructor, we can call Redux's subscribe method and dereference state out of the store, and then set it into our elements property interface. And here we're using Polymer 2.0's set properties API. Uh, which provides a really efficient way to do a batch of, of multiple properties into an element. And next, we can add event listeners for any custom DOM events that will be fired from that element. And then we can call Redux's dispatch method to notify the store of actions that have taken place. And we'll, you will do this by using functions uh, that create an action object. So Redux calls these action creators. And we'll do that for any of the events that, we need to, uh, that, that our component will, will emit that need to update global state. And remember, this explore page JS is lazy loaded only with the slash explore route, for example. So rather than loading all of the state management code with the app, we want to load it and install it alongside only the components that need it. So you can add a little code to enhance Redux with the ability to incrementally build up global logic in the store. So that logic that manages the part of the state that a component depends on can be lazily loaded along with the component and then added into the store. Likewise, any non-trivial logic needed uh, should also be separated out and loaded along with only the components that need them to ensure that you're achieving optimal delivery. So we're going to continue experimenting with patterns for state management and how we think they can fit into a web component-based application. And I also want to give a shout out to the Polymer Redux library, uh, which is a community library that approaches binding Polymer components to Redux in a much more declarative fashion. So like I said before, there's a lot of innovation happening in this space, and Redux is really just one choice. And virtually any of these global patterns can work totally well uh, with web components really seamlessly. So finally, once uh, development is our, of our app is complete and we're ready to deliver it to our users, we'll need to host it and serve it to clients. And although a lot can be accomplished by statically serving our client application, uh, there are a few minimal features that we feel are required to be implemented on the server to really achieve this optimal user experience. 
So we want to be able to serve our app shell for all rich URLs in order to enable client-side routing. We want to serve either route-based dependencies using HTTP push or route-based bundles for non-push capable browsers. We want to serve different builds uh, optimized to target different user agents. And we want to serve static content also uh, for search engine crawlers that might not execute JavaScript. So we've been doing a lot of work on a reference server that does all of these good things called Purple Server Node, uh, which is designed to work hand in hand with build output from the Polymer CLI. So a lot of things you heard Sam talk about a little earlier today, we're trying to kind of make much easier to achieve uh, with Purple Server Node. So this is a node-based server that's set up for client-side routing, and it also has built-in presets in order to serve optimal code depending on the browser capabilities of a particular client. So it has presets to know which browsers have ES6 support and can take advantage of custom element subclassing and which need ES5 compiled code. It can also differentiate between the, those that take advantage of HTTP2 push support to serve granular components uh, for better efficiency in caching, and those that will need bundled code. And will also serve uh, the optimal set of code for a client, uh, given what the client can actually execute. So last, it will also leverage a new project that we're working on called RenderTron uh, for those bots and crawlers that don't execute JavaScript and social network crawlers like Facebook and Twitter in order to serve a fully rendered HTML uh, for optimal SEO and social snippet generation. So stay tuned for more on that, uh, and you can check more uh, about the Purple Server Node beta uh, here on GitHub. So that's it. Those are the key aspects that we see uh, in taking advantage of the modern web platform to ship fast and high-quality apps, uh, and also reduce your pain during web development. So you can really start to see how the interplay of these different web platform features, web components, and service worker, and HTTP2, let you achieve a result that's greater than just the sum of the parts. So we're going to keep exploring on the developer experience team ways to package up these concepts and make them easier for you and your teams to take direct advantage of. Uh, but in the meantime, I encourage you to take a look at some of the latest with web components and start applying some of these concepts and ideas to your uh, current web applications. So thank you so much, uh, and stay tuned for more coming from Polymer. <laughs>